Good evening. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for fighting your way through the bus and the train and down the street and making that virus just bounce right off of you, and you <laughs> made it here. It's been a crazy day of cancellations, and I'm just really glad to see the turnout tonight because I think you're in for a real treat. Um, my name is Naomi Krogman. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Environment at Simon Fraser University. And I first want to begin by acknowledging that we are on the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. And I'd also like to say we are live streaming the event and the recording will also be available on our website for anyone who wasn't able to come tonight or watch it now. We are really fortunate to have this exciting trio speak tonight. Uh, it's a very distinguished lineup of knowledgeable people. First of all, we have Anne Solomon. She is one of Canada's foremost coastal marine ecologists with talent for catalyzing evidence-informed changes to practices. Her research has been internationally recognized for its contribution towards integrating diverse disciplines and sources of knowledge to advance conservation science and practice. She has been named a Pew Fellow in Marine Conservation awarded the International Prize for Profession Excellence in Ecology, and was just induct inducted into the Royal Society of Canada College, which is Canada's highest academic honor. We're very proud of her. We also have Ke'il Juice, Barbara J. Wilson. She is an elected representative of the Council of the Haida Nation and an alumnus of SFU's Faculty of Education having just earned her master's degree last year. Congratulations. Barbara was an official observer at COP21 Paris in 2015, chair of the Committee on Indigenous Justice and Residential Schools, is on the board of directors for Coast Opportunity Funds, and has been a member of the Legal Aid Society for over 30 years. In her community, she is a mother, grandmother, aunt, sister, great-grandmother, and a friend to many. Her passions are her family, her home, Haida Gwaii, writing, research, leaving the world a better place through education, and helping others to appreciate traditional knowledge. Finally, we also have Daniel Pauly. Can you wave? There he is. Daniel is a French and Canadian citizen who has lived in several countries, including France, Germany, the Philippines, and Canada. In 1994, Daniel joined the Fisheries Center at UBC and later became the director for five years. He is principal investigator of the Sea Around Us Project, um, which has been funded for 15 years by the Pew Charitable Trusts, <clears throat> and he is devoted to studying, documenting, and promoting policies to mitigate the impact of fisheries on the world's marine ecosystem. Thank you, and with that, I will introduce Anne. Thank you. Kate and Juice handed the key, Gaga. Yet, Hadiga, Kifki, Barbara Wilson. I would like to say hawa, thank you to the Coast Salish people for allowing us to live, to learn, and to pass through their nation, waters and lands. As you can see, my people um, have traveled up and down the coast for many millennia, and we um, have relatives down here. So we like to acknowledge them each time we come into um, this area. Each of these people represent a nation that we've worked with over the past uh, seven years. And <clears throat> we'd like to uh, n you all to know that what we're doing here today is looking at ways to change our lives, not just the First Nations lives, but everyone's. We think that we have a better way of living if we work together. I would like to point out that Robert Payne 
is instrumental in both of us being here tonight. Uh, he elected Anne as a Pew Fellow, and as a result of her working as a Pew Fellow, I um, have been involved as a cultural advisor, as well as the work I do on my own. So as you can see, some of Bob's um, foremost thoughts lie in species interactions. He says, you can't manage out of ignorance. You have to know what species do, whom they eat, what role these prey species play. When you know that, you can begin to make some intelligent decisions. <clears throat> Bob was a, a mentor of mine, and he would love to know that I would like to add two other key additions to this comment. I also think you need to consider people as key predators in ecosystems. And to really understand the dynamics of systems today, we need to dive back through time, deep time. And that's where Barb and I would like to start this story, the story that we want to share with you, the first of three stories, and that's the stories of, of human interactions along our coast. And in fact, the story starts at least 14,000 years ago, when some of the earliest people came to the Americas via this maritime route, highly likely, bringing with them um, knowledge and experience and interactions with these coastal ecosystems for thousands of years. So when Barb and I look at coastal ecosystems, we see them as coupled human uh, systems where humans have been interacting with um, exploiting, over-exploiting, learning, managing and stewarding some of these areas for thousands of years. And of course, that changed dramatically with the um, early arrival of Europeans in the late 1700s. And in fact, you can see here Haida Gwaii in one of the first contact sites um, right at the northern tip by Juan Perez in, the, in 1774. And this caused a, a complete change or transformation in this couple social ecological system As we look at what happened, it not only changed the environment that we live in today, but it also changed how we um, gather food and what kinds of food we gather. With, with the management of sea otter, my people always knew what um, and how to keep balance by, by um, hunting and fishing and and being very um, deliberate in the ways they manage the very spheres um, of Haida Gwaii. Uh, when I speak, I'm speaking almost primarily about Haida Gwaii because I don't hold the knowledge of other, uh, other nations. So what happened to us was as the sea otters disappeared, we ended up with all kinds of food and light or sea urchins. And those sea urchins um, ate the kelp, which changed the dynamics of the ocean in the areas that we live in. And as you know now, the dynamics of, of climate change is affecting also all these different things that are in part of the water column as well as what's on the ocean, or I'm sorry, the land and the sky. And many of you are probably very familiar with this story of the functional extinction of sea otters and some of the direct and indirect effects that Barb just described. But many of you may not know that, that with the arrival of Europeans came really other important dramatic social changes. And that was the colonial dispossession of indigenous governance systems and economies. And these systems were very complex systems that include a, included a diversity of different stewardship practices. Um, for example, very complex marine tenure systems that Barb will dive into in a little bit, and trade networks. And with the, um, the arrival of Europeans and this functional extinction of this predator, there also came this erosion of some of these very important governance institutions, protocols, and practices. So one of the things we find is with the extirpation of the sea otters, um, it affected a lot of the foods such as the herring on, on kelp and other um, things that depend on the kelp, ourselves included. So as we look at 
the um, sea otters coming back to our waters and up and down the coast as they move from places such as Alaska in the north and Vancouver Island on the south and also farther south in California. What we find is that the food that we depend on on an annual and year-round basis is being compromised again. And so we look at what kind of challenges we have. And so the biggest challenge is, as I mentioned earlier, we both have a right to food. And so how do we do this uh, respectfully of, of them and how do we continue to eat ourselves as we look at uh, the return of the sea otters and the acidification of the ocean and the um, climate change generally, water getting warmer and things like that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so there's some pretty stark trade-offs that happen when a keystone predator like this comes back to a system. Um, you saw in the previous picture that that sea otter had uh, actually an abalone in its paw and the northern abalone, Haliotis Kamschikana, that's uh, one of Canada's first um, endangered invertebrate species. So not only does it create a conservation challenge, but it creates a real trade-off among social and ecological benefits that, that uh, are associated with really different states of, of reefs, forested states um, and deforested states. Both of these states have ecological and social benefits and costs. And what's tricky is that those um, benefits don't flow equitably among all people, which again adds to conflict. So with this Pew Fellow uh, ship that Anne got, we tried to decide how we were going to uh, look at the return of sea otters. So we decided that if we were going to be um, honorable to the people in the different territories, because uh, we acknowledge that we're in somebody's unceded territory, we, we talk about uh, reconciliation. And so we wanted to uh, lead and show you or show people how we think this should be done. So we had an idea. We talked about, about uh, the idea that people on the West Coast were not happy with sea otters returning to their waters. We knew why, but we wanted to hear from them what they wanted. So we went first to the New Chalnos on the west coast of, and we, we were invited to their, to their, um, oh, what's it called? Their house, it's like a house of assembly. And um, the night before, Anne and I had been invited to a dinner and um, they fed us uh, boiled fish heads. For me, that's a real delicacy. And, and I think they were, they were watching to see how we were going to react to these fish heads. So we sat there and we ate them very deliberately with our hands. Somebody came over to talk to us after a while. So then um, we went back to the room and we were going to finalize our talk, much the same as what we did today, finalize our talk. And we're, I'm sitting at the typewriter or at the computer and I'm saying to Anne, what do you think, Anne? Because I'm really nervous because in the back of my head, I know they don't like sea otters. And Anne keeps saying to me, you're the driver, you're the driver. So I go to sleep that night and in the morning, just as I'm waking up, I'm, I'm dreaming I'm on this big white bus. The bus has no windows at the back and I'm the driver and I'm going down the hill backwards. So you can see the state I was in about going and talking to these people about, about sea otters. As it turned out, we went. At 11 o'clock, we had an hour to speak to, to them. And the room is probably three times this room, eh? Mm -hmm. Three times the size of this room. And there were all these tables sitting around. And each of them had a, a label in front of them. And they had... Um, uh, mic and headphones and everything. And when we finished our talk, telling them we had an idea, a man way across the room, I could hardly see him, 
he jumped up and he made a, what do you call it, motion? Yeah. He made a motion that they send two of their hot with their chiefs, two of their char chiefs to uh, represent their table. And uh, that was the beginning of, of our putting our, our steering committee together. So what we ended up with after doing a meeting, the similar meeting in the Central Coast with the HEMAS of the um, Health Sick Nation and the Lana Algalung of Haida Gwaii, we ended up with, with the men and women that you see at the bottom here. That was, these people were our um, steering committee for the past uh, seven years. And we worked with them traveling together, talking and planning what we were going to do um, for this project. Now about this bus story, Barb <laughs> tells us bus story because she's really nervous. And I remember saying to you, Barb, you think you're nervous. I was the only non-native person in that room of over 200 people. <laughs> so it was a very nerve wracking thing, but it was the best thing that we could have done. And it's just become so obvious to me as to why. And it's because we asked for consent by to from the rights holders of all of these coastal areas we were interested in working with. And they guided this project. And with that, um, we had a lot of authority to do what we did because of this council. So what exactly did we do? Um, these questions reflect some of the guidance that we got from this, this, our steering committee, uh, the scientists that work on this, myself, Barb, and my students. So we wanted to know when, how, and to what degree do some of these kelp forest tipping points between states occur today in British Columbia? And what did they look like in deep time thousands of years ago, given that the same components of the system roughly interacted in probably different proportions in probably different ways? And then what kind of conditions will actually facilitate adaptation to this pretty um, profound disturbance uh, today? So one of the first things that we did is we held a transdisciplinary workshop. This is back in 2014 on the coast, and you can see the diversity of people that attended this workshop from um, across British Columbia, up in Alaska, and down in California. And the whole idea was to bring together people that had been working in this field for some time to start scoping what exactly we would be doing and looking for in this project. The other part of that group was the knowledge holders from the various communities that we were working with. Mm -hmm. And they came and we, uh, we had quite an interesting time discussing the different things that we were kind of um, branch offs from, from the questions, the three questions we were asking. Mm -hmm. Right, so just to give you a sense of a taste of some of the um, results of our work from today, what we did is we took advantage of this uh, space for time substitution, this gradient in sea occupation time up and down the coast, uh, the central coast. So you can see the dots there, they, they differ in color representing the different number of years that otters have actually occupied a place. And that allowed us to kind of have a crystal ball of what things might look like in the future. And here is um, in photographs what happens to a reef after sea otters have occupied it for a year. So what you're looking at is rocky reef, um, like your uh, plane or, or satellite, looking down at kelp forest that's outlined in purple. And really quickly within a year, you see a uh, huge um, increase in the spatial extent and depth of kelp. Now, this is a bit surprising in Alaska. It takes about 10 years or more. In California, a little bit longer as well. So things happen very quickly, these tipping points in British Columbia. We also use some uh, different scientific tools to look at the flow of energy and carbon through the food web. And what happens when you have predators that come back to a system is you tend to diversify the structure of who eats who or the trophic structure in a food web. That's what's illustrated by this lingcod that's um, feeding on a, a juvenile rockfish. So you see really dramatic changes in the flow of carbon. 
And like I foreshadowed earlier with the abalone, some species do well and some species do poorly. And abalone themselves um, in this area after 30 years of otter occupation time decreased by 16 fold. They also decreased in size and they became better at hiding, they became more cryptic. And so we actually did find densities of otters alive and well in cracks and crevices. And these, these um, invertebrates are broadcast spawners, that means egg and sperm need to meet in the water to be able to produce a little larva, a little baby. And so many of these populations, even in the older occupation sites, um, seem to be doing relatively well, just at far fewer densities and, and smaller sizes. But this is one of the biggest surprises that happened on our coast um, associated with uh, climate change, a marine heat wave in 2015 and 16, and gave us some clues as to why tipping points happen so quickly in BC. This beautiful animal is um, sunflower sea star, Pycnopodia. It is like the Bengal tiger of the sea, I like to say. It doesn't get much credit. But when this marine heat wave struck, um, many of you probably know it was associated with sea star wasting disease. And uh, the biomass of this benthic predator, the seafloor predator, declined by 90%. So essentially it became a ghost of ecosystems past because of this climate-induced sea star wasting disease. And if you look at the density of kelp that's on your y-axis and the density of sea urchins on your bottom axis there, it, before and after sea star wasting disease, what you can see is that those two states that I was talking about earlier that are described by those green and red balls, the size of the ball represents the biomass of how many urchins that are there, they, they really change. And so it turns out that this benthic predator, Pycnopodia, stabilizes kelp forest systems and destabilizes urchin barrens, which is why we get these really quick changes. So understanding the dynam dynamics of the system were, were really important, um, but it also gets us thinking about the past, where we started, and reco recovery targets for coastal ecosystems today, recovery targets for sea otters. And implicitly or explicitly, depending on whether you're in the US or Canada, there's the general assumption that in the past, sea otters were at carrying capacity and that kelp forests were everywhere. Thus, you can imagine that kelp forest highway as a long stretch of kelp. But there's increasingly more data that contests this idea. So when you look at um, the stories that we hold in our traditional knowledge and we talk about how areas were um, governed and how they were looked after. The thing that you see is that <clears throat> we used everything and we did everything to try and keep the um, everything stable. So in here you can see the use of um, various sea seafoods and the different years, and you can see the density of, of all of them. And what it turns out is that we were eating sea otters, but we were also eating seafood. And areas were left, um, some areas, as I said earlier, were left um, for the sea otters. Other areas were, were kept for the people. So up and down the coast of Haida Gwaii, um, you'll find these these um, midden, uh, I don't Deposits. know what, that are, are indicative of the amount of seafood and the, the bones from the sea otters. You'll see them in, in the old village sites. And uh, so what we want to show you here now is just a glimpse of some of the things that have been um, recorded by the archaeologists that have been in the different areas. Right. So just as Barb said, this is a shill midden, and you can dig back through time to look at the relative proportion of things that were harvested and consumed. Um, and so by doing that, you can get a better sense of our coast. And it turns out our coast actually didn't look like this 10,000 years ago. It looked like this. The, these, each dot here represents um, an identified shell midden. There's some shell middens that are not on this map. The, the ones that are not on the maps, um, they're not on the maps because probably what happened, there was no way of getting 
um, dollars and cents to hire um, crews to come in and go through the whole of islands. And so when you look at this, you know that on the west coast of Haida Gwaii, there were a lot of old village sites. And certainly before uh, the 1600s, there, they would have been fully occupied, but because the areas aren't designated as federal government um, parks or provincial parks, they don't have the wherewithal to do all the excavating that's needed to show. And it's the same for all of the coast. So keeping in mind that, as Barb said, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Nonetheless, the coasts were thoroughly occupied by people. And if you look in those shell middens and you look at their relative proportion of sea otter bones relative to other marine mammals, like seals, sea lions, and northern fur seals, with each bubble there representing that relative proportion, the bigger the bubble, the greater the proportion, you see that sea otters were extensively hunted in the area. So then what did these coupled human ocean systems look like in deep time? And for that, we turn to this animal that many of you may know of. This is the California mussel, um, a prey item for both people and sea otters. And we looked at the number and size of these mussels in areas uh, today, modern areas with sea otters, areas today, modern areas without otters, and gray um, data from those shell middens and through time in two different areas. And I want to show you the data here um, to, to give you a sense of the relative size of muscle. So on the y-axis, you're just looking at the relative proportion of different size classes of muscles that are on the bottom axis. And that's just showing you the distribution of um, little ones to your left and bigger ones to your right. In blue, it's contemporary data in areas with sea otters, in white areas without sea otters from today, and again, gray, those ancient muscle sizes. And what you can see is that those ancient muscle sizes tend to look like areas today without sea otters, essentially providing some lines of evidence that in the past people precluded sea otters from uh, close village sites where harvesting was happening. <clears throat> so our management of, of these areas uh, was uh, spatially like we, we did very explicit hunting and our old stories will tell you that there are stories that um, talk about um, in front of Skidigat, for instance, how there was no seafood there and uh, how all these sea otters were in the inlet. And one has to wonder why uh, Hanakafli was chosen to let the, let the sea otters or the crew survive in a place like that because there were villages there, the same as all the other places. And, and we know that the selective hunting that happened, happened by the um, people who were the hereditary leaders of the various um, areas up and down the coast, both on Haida Gwaii and up and down the, um, what's now known as the BC coast. And that we did have restrictions on not just the sea otters because uh, conservation was just as important uh, because we depended on them for food, for clothing, for material things inside the home. And so you wanted to make sure that the babies were born, had mamas to look after them. You wanted to make sure that you didn't disrupt um, a fishing uh, a terminal fishery at the wrong time. And, and so looking at all these things, we see that it was very important for us to know the, the seasonal rounds um, and what we could do without fear of jeopardizing. Because our stories told us if we were disrespectful, we would lose the use of those things. So given our dive into the past and our assessment of what was happening today, the next thing we wanted to do was start imagining um, 
the future and, and strategies to deal with um, adapting to this change in the future. And what we did is we went to uh, ground zero for sea otter recovery in British Columbia. That's Kayukit, uh, Cheklisit, First Nation on the west coast of Vancouver Island, and up in Alaska to the Sukupiak Nation, um, Nanwalak, Alaska, the first and last fur trading post um, uh, in the world by the Russians. So that's where you're seeing um, some of the people that we talked to. And we interviewed these people. We did both interviews and surveys. And we got a sense from them, um, people that have been living with this recovery for between uh, 70 and 50 years, what enabled them to adapt. And from that, we drew kind of four major um, recommendations for the nations that were here in British Columbia looking to forward and asking, what do we need to do to prepare? How can we adapt to the recovery in our communities? And one of the major take home messages we got was the importance of strengthening indigenous governance authority when it came to making decisions, not just about sea otter management or kelp forest management, but coastal near shore areas, and that this really is an issue of justice. Um, one of the things we, we talk, talked about was implementing adaptive co-management between the first um, citizens or the First Nations of the various areas and the various governments. And because Haida Gwaii has been one of the first areas to do this, we had, we had some experience and we've used it with other nations. And the thing that it brings with co-management is the trust that you build through discussion and and coming to um, agreements and and not having to have one person or one group of people back down to uh, have the other person happy. So the capacity to oh, I've lost my head. Um, the capacity to build those relationships and have them transparent is very important because w my father always told me that we have to live our words. And so we use this principle when we're working at the various tables that I sit at and other members of my nation sit at when we're working on these. We actually heard specific examples of experimentation with different policies really reflected in this whole notion of adaptive management. Um, of course, we also heard that it was important to uh, respect and listen to Indigenous knowledge and weave that in with the Western science knowledge that was gained, and that by bringing these two knowledge systems together, it actually improved everybody's understanding of the system. And, and finally, what the, the other key recommendation was sharing information across nations that are experiencing different stages of recovery is indeed really useful. Yes. So we did several things. We looked at, at um, how we could use the information that we had gathered from the, the various places, the uh, Supiak in, in Alaska, the New Chalmers on Vancouver Island, the Heltzik, and the Haida. And we used it to put together ideas for, for the different places. And because Haida Gwaii hadn't had any sea otters um, there full time yet, it was really important for us to learn the lessons and, and really learn how our ancestors governed and looked after these things. So we learned from past stories, we learned from the experience of the people up and down the coast. And we took those and are taking them now um, as part of the council. I bring that knowledge back to my people as well as the hereditary leaders who were the advisors with us. So um, listening to the advice of creating some kind of learning exchange program, we created this digital learning platform. It's called coastalvoices.net. You can go and listen to many of these stories that are on a video. Um, you can look at all of the scientific papers that we've shared some of the key results of. And this is a way of sharing that information. And beyond digitally, we also went to different nations. 
So this is a picture of um, the lady on the left is um, Witsitskum from the Nuchalnas Nation. She's a hereditary leader. And the lady on the right is from um, the Sukpiak people. And they're talking about, about the various things and what culture means, culturally modified um, sea otter pelts mean, because they cannot, they cannot export uh, pelts without them being um, culturally modified. So uh, learning, because Witsitskum and their people are still in negotiations with the um, fisheries department here in Canada, and it's been very difficult for them up to the last year to come to terms with, um, or fisheries to come to terms with what should be happening if, if we're earnest about working together. And the, one of the last things we just want to share with you is we made a short documentary film, and we're just going to show you a little clip from the first three minutes to give you a better sense of, of this project. And that will be the, the last part of this story. A cloud would feel like it's soft as uh, eagle down. Special animals that only chiefs and their hunters were permitted to take. We were very prized in terms of uh, the, the pelts. Only hot wear or people of high standing were ever, were ever had them. The sea otter in our language is called quat quat. We say quat quat. Try not to ask me how to spell it. <laughs> the, the sea otter, um, they call it kulu. I believe that sea, the sea otter has a place in our environment. They play a role where kelp forests are growing. Um, we know that without the sea otter, uh, kelp forests would be overtaken by sea urchins. But we have to learn how to maintain that balance. So as we look at all these things, we're having to redefine what sustainable operating space means and look at coastal fisheries with the sea otters coming in and with climate change. So it's not just about security of food, although it's the most important part of it, it's security of our, of our ocean world and those of us that live along the coast. Mm -hmm. So what we just shared with you was one of the three vignettes we want to show um, you today. The next two are quite a bit smaller and shorter, but we felt really um, appropriate to keep on this line and this discussion of what sustainability and justice might look like here in British Columbia. And of course, um, managing the predation impacts of sea otters is just one of the diverse management and stewardship practices that happened. Another one of them that many of you probably have heard about um, is the creation of clam gardens, ancient clam gardens. So just to get a sense, how many of you have heard of clam gardens? <coughs> right, wow, okay, so no need to explain. When I give this talk in California, I get, you know, maybe a hand. So you all know this is pretty remarkable. Um, at least this one um, on Quadra Island is 3,000 years old and have been known to people for a long time, but new to science, very new to science. Um, so you all know then that there's a rock wall that's at the low intertidal, kind of between zero and just below one meter above chart datum. And these were created by people. And um, it turns out that they really do increase clam production. Um, as one would expect. So what you're looking at here is just the number of little net clams um, at different size classes. The green bars represent the density or number and area from clam gardens and blue non-clam gardens or non-wall beaches. Um, you can see that you see the biggest effect kind of in certain size classes. 
And I've got a quote here from Davy Wilson, who's uh, from the Health Sick Nation. He said, we transplanted clams in the gardens so that we didn't have to go very far. We put gravel in the garden to increase the number of clams. Only certain families owned clam gardens and the whole family would look after it. So there's a couple of key things to pick out from this quote. Um, one, there was uh, intentional modification of habitat, both um, in terms of the substrate and, as you'll soon see, the tidal elevation. Um, people transplanted clams themselves. They moved them around. And there was local proprietorship or ownership over certain areas. And as you heard from Barb earlier in the sea otter story, that's a common theme across our coast is that um, these kind of territorial use rights for fishing. So clam gardens, even those that aren't tended today, can double or quadruple the amount of clams in them. Now, we also wanted to ask questions like scientists do about kind of production rates of clams. And so we spent a lot of time tagging lots of little baby clams. And we, we did our own clam garden experiment. And we, we buried them in clam gardens and non-wall beaches. And we looked at how fast they grew so we could measure the production rate of the biomass that was kind of consumable for people. So um, when you think about tidal elevations, they're a bit tricky because they're not, not linear. So I had to talk to my dad about my hypotheses. This is my dad and I on Long Beach, and my dad in, in the front row here, a physicist. And um, you can see in the sand, I was drawing my hypotheses for my dad here. So I said, Dad, you know, I'm, I'm imagining how clam growth rates vary as a function of intertidal height. And we were looking at that rocky reef there. I don't know if you remember dad. And we were looking at the, um, the muscle ranges, right? And then here are my hypotheses in blue here, non-well beaches, in green, clam garden beaches. And um, this was in winter time, sometime was cold. And I'll never forget when my student Amy Grosbeck um, brought this graph to me um, within a couple of weeks. And I thought, right, okay, this is indeed what you see. You see that um, these clam gardens basically kind of shrink the tidal elevation where clams grow and survive best in height, but expand it in terms of landscape or um, amount of area. So really optimizing the growing conditions for clams. Um, our most recent data suggests that clam gardens stabilize temperatures, which is useful under today's conditions of um, extreme climatic events. They make um, near shore systems uh, soft sediment beaches warmer in the winter and cooler in the summer. And that sediment that Davy was talking about, um, that increased carbonate actually also is one of the reasons why you get these greater growth rates and this greater production in clam gardens. But it wasn't just clam gardens and it wasn't just the management of predation near shore. There's a whole diversity of stewardship and management practices that happen on our coast. Up and down the coast you'll find in the, in the um, uh, estuaries, you'll find root gardens, you'll find them up on the hills, you'll find them um, orchards, you'll find what I call naunai, which is the octopus, octopus houses that are man-made and they're made out of rocks. And if you lift the capstone off, there's usually a little octopi in, inside of it. So we know also that it happened in the forest. There were orchards. Uh, there were all kinds of things. Uh, there was, when droughts happened, they cut, or in order to avoid having to worry about the salmon, they would cut deep Vs into the river so that the water was um, located and situated in the V and the fish could still get up the streams to spawn when, when we had droughts. So over the last five years now, we've had severe drought systems up and down Haida Gwaii and no doubt in other places. So we're, we're looking at the types of, of ways we would have used for uh, corralling fish. These are our fish uh, fences or gates and what they do is they would take the biggest fish and have them go up the creek and they would take the smaller ones so that the jack springs or jack sockeyes 
um, didn't uh, breed with the bigger fish, so that gave you the capacity of healthier fish. So we look at those things. We look at how um, the ownership, if you look up above Elroy's hand, there were, there were some um, markings up on the walls there, and that tells you that that area belongs to someone, and he's, he's explaining it to a group that have come, come to see what management looks like. And so we have a long history of management in resources, and it's not just in the intertidal, it's on the hill, it's on the beach, it's up on the mountain, and it's down the other side too. Right, so uh, many innovations that took uh, perhaps hundreds, maybe even thousands of years to innovate um, in the Holocene certainly can be used today um, in the Anthropocene, we think. Yeah. And um, one great example of um, looking to the past to innovate in the future is the uh, Clam Garden Restoration Project that's being led by my student Sky Augustine in collaboration with Parks Canada, with the Hulkaminum and Wasanich Working Groups that are bringing people back into clam gardens. So these are actually being tended and managed and the rock walls are being built up like you can see here. So, so as we look at the next phase, we're looking at herring and the importance of that to fish, to the ocean people, and to the people who live on the lands. And as you can see here, there's been a big um, <clears throat> decline in, in the amount of, of herring that is along the coast. And so every year we speak with, with fisheries to try and deter them from fishing out the last um, segments of our, our herring stocks. As a young girl, I remember that we had um, herring in Skidigat Inlet, and I would push my bed up to the window at night, and it was like watching a small mobile community, these big boats with big lights, and they would be brailing the herring and taking it away for um, I imagine at that time it was um, for dog food and things like that. It yeah. wasn't very useful. So there's been, like many of you probably know, great uncertainty and debate over Pacific herring and the, the fisheries associated with them, in part because of the uncertainty around the spatial dimensions of each stock or population, um, the uncertainty around the population estimates themselves, the drivers of change, be it um, climate change, harvest, um, predation by marine mammals, and of course there's the issue of rights. And what I want to show you is that I think um, one way to navigate through this conflict and debate, um, as we did in the sea otter example, is to start sharing knowledge. And so what you're looking at here um, is Bill Gladstone. This is the uh, person that won the Supreme Court of Canada case. Um, in 1996 um, to the, the right to commercially sell herring and student Anna Gerard and they are drawing along with many others the uh, herring spawn along the coast through time on a decade by decade basis based on traditional knowledge to complement uh, DFO or Department of Fisheries and Oceans records and to go back even further in time. So what you're looking at here is the estimate of total kilometers of herring spawn from local knowledge holders that when a herring spawn, you can't miss it, right? That first photograph, it's pretty obvious. And because it's, it's in your home, you remember where it happens. Um, essentially, we documented about an 8% decline um, per decade and a spatial contraction um, in the diversity of actual spawning areas where herring do spawn. But it wasn't really until we started looking at the entire system that we got a better sense of what needs to change when it comes to the governance of herring. And we want to kind of end off almost with a little uh, video um, because we're getting at that time, right? And I have to do a few Fanagan things here to make this work, but here we go. Okay. Social ecological rebellion has become oh. Hang on. We can see it and you can't. Why is that? A, oh, I know. Right. Okay. I escape here. Now, is this yeah. good? This is, yeah. Okay. Take two.
Social ecological resilience has become a central concept in sustainability science. Yet translating this concept into practice has been limited by a lack of tools to measure it. We developed a method to measure social ecological resilience and applied it to a coupled human ocean system on the northwest coast of Canada, where for thousands of years, Indigenous people have harvested and managed marine resources, including Pacific herring. Each spring, herring migrate to the coast to lay their eggs along vast stretches of shoreline, nourishing a diversity of coastal predators and fueling coastal food webs, local livelihoods, and cultures. Here, Herring eggs are traditionally harvested and traded by coastal First Nations by suspending tree boughs and kelp into the ocean to collect the spawned eggs. Yet the future of this practice is directly tied to the resilience of the entire social ecological system, including its capacity to adapt and transform in response to changing ocean conditions, societal values, international markets, and shifting governance practices. We measured how the resilience of this system has changed through time by translating theoretical principles of resilience into ecological and social metrics specific to this natural resource system. We then used expert knowledge to assess these metrics and how they've changed through three sequential governance periods. We found a significant decline in system-wide resilience between the previous Indigenous and most recent centralized governance regimes and limited change with the onset of the most recent governance era. But we also found signs of recovery among several dimensions of resilience, signaling preconditions for transformation in Canadian fisheries governance and specific leverage points to catalyze this change. These include expanding management objectives to support diversity including diverse spawning habitats, populations, and size classes of fish, and diverse livelihood objectives for people. Increasing connectivity by improving information sharing between federal and indigenous management agencies. Engaging with learning-based bridging organizations to build trust and co-produce knowledge. Co-developing future scenarios to better understand how the system works. And ultimately, sharing power and authority in evidence-based decision-making across federal and Indigenous management agencies. Pinpointing the erosion and recovery of key system attributes that confer social ecological resilience can reveal strategic pathways to enable deliberate transformation from business as usual environmental governance towards approaches that are more ecologically sustainable and socially just. Okay, to wrap up. So we're looking at <clears throat> these three things. Sea otters and kelp, kelp forests, ancient clam gardens, and Pacific herring. And the, one, the two things we came up with out of all this is, besides all the things we've learned otherwise, is to ask for, ask consent so going into a nation, we don't go with a ready-made package. We seek guidance from them because they're the shareholders or the rights holders from the start of the project. So before we even start writing it up, we, we go and seek permission. And we weave the traditional and scientific knowledge to build trust and transparency to create the possibility for legitimacy. And I think that we've learned that it's important to look at the laws that these people have been governed by for thousands of years. In this case, this is my, the laws of my ancestors. Or to act respectfully or do respectful acts. When we do something wrong, we find ways to make it right between ourselves and nature. Ista at iskit is reciprocity. 
My father told me that in the old days, if one person was hung hungry, it meant everybody was hungry because we looked after each other. And yaki kis gulas, and this is speaking your truth. So if you tell us you're going to do something, you can't be like unmentionables and not follow up what you've said you'd do. So we want to dedicate um, all of this work to two important people that really created the opportunity for it, Nick Tanafi Sr. in Alaska um, and Nice West. And Nice West. Nice West is my father. He um, Sorry. passed away when he was 96. And during that time, he taught me a lot of things that today I honor him. We also want to say um, thank you to all of the voices that you got to hear a little bit of, uh, the team of students and researchers, and the funders that made this work possible. So thank you very much. And with that, we want to turn it over to a um, very accomplished, iconoclastic man <laughs> that can give you all a global perspective. Barb and I offered a, a very local perspective, and um, Daniel Pauly's been working on global data sets for some time now. So if we could welcome Daniel Pauly to come and give his thoughts. We are very lucky to have him here. So yeah. you get this. So good evening. So I'm here and you clap. And I'm supposed to give a global perspective, but uh, Anne also told me I shouldn't present um, a, my PowerPoints. And the problem is that uh, the global perspective can be best shown by showing the expansion of fisheries. And uh, you have to imagine the PowerPoint that I don't have, because she told me not to. Uh, anyway, um, where in the 50s we began with dash of red around North America and Europe, and this dash of red spreads over the whole entire ocean, because we now are doing to the ocean the same thing that we are doing to the land that we uh, massacre through uh, uh, our agriculture that is not sustainable and deforestation. They, essentially, we are deforesting the ocean. And uh, then the question comes, why that? And I was uh, uh, this weekend, uh, the, the last weekend, in Denman and uh, Hornby Island for the Herring Fest, where they talked about, at depth, about one of the three items that, were co that was covered, uh, that were covered tonight. And I will uh, then quickly get to, to Hornby Island because I can add to this. Anyway, so the question is, why this expansion? Well, my lecture actually began with uh, the expansion of human out of Africa, then the expansion, the Polynesian expansion uh, uh, of, uh, across the Pacific and the Indian Ocean, then the expansion of agriculture that had uh, before uh, taking place. Then the expansion of industrial fishing that began in England uh, with the uh, deployment of the first trawlers. The first trawlers was, were fielded in 1880, the first steam trawlers, sorry. And, and industrialization then spread over the whole world. And every time we have a wave of spread uh, that leaves almost nothing behind. And we are at the end of this spread. I was, as a young man, in Indonesia uh, in, 70, in the year 75, teaching people how to use troll and troll, introducing trolling. This was the, the idea that uh, we would modernize the fishery. It's completely crazy. I realize now that we were, we were destroying the, the resource of, the, of, the, of that country. 
And uh, this expansion is never sustainable, it, but it, it, uh, it feeds like a Ponzi scheme, like a giant Ponzi scheme. It feeds uh, the markets that are really infinite, infinite for all purposes by the acquisition of new resource and uh, never are the resource sustainably exploited. You, you go, you expand, you keep expanding. And because we have now reached the end of the world, as you know, the early flat and, uh, and, and we are at the edge, and the, uh, the catch of the world, the, the world catch is declining since 96 approximately, while the, 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 the fishing for it, the, the, the fishing effort that we expand is about three, four times globally what we need. Uh, so we are, the different countries are fighting over a declining resource and scraping the ground. Now getting back to BC, how did it manifest itself? Well, first, what could have been mentioned that in the middens that uh, were are being excavated uh, all along the coast of BC and along the coast of the Northwest Pacific, the, the dominant fish is herring. Uh, this is true that salmon was very important and clam also, but the dominant fish was herring. Herring was always there to feed people. And the things that tourists come for to beautiful BC for, the, they come for to see, to see whales and humpback whales now, <clears throat> and um, they come to see, <clears throat> to see orcas and stuff. This is all animals that live off herring. They, they all live off herring. But the herring, can I have some water? The herrings uh, have become less and less. And you have seen this decline. That's the decline of the stock that are being exploited, but there are many stocks that are not being exploited. And the concept, and thank you, I'm a professor of fisheries, uh, though it is my prerogative to bore you with details. Um, <laughs> the, the concept is that uh, um, in, in, in the course of, of evolution, uh, you have a lots of local population, uh, the Brits call here of stocklets, and around Britain, for example, they were in every bay a single stocklet uh, of herring and other fish species, but herring, the, the European herring, Scrupia herringus. Now, these stocklets have all been eliminated by, fish, by fishing and uh, industrial fishing. And what, is, what remained is only one big stock in the North Sea that is being exported by lots of countries. And exactly the same thing has happened here. In the 60s, in the 50s and 60s, the, the stocklets that were in it every bay, in Ho Sound, and, oh, I did not pronounce it right, Ho Sound, and uh, uh, the, the various uh, fjords that we have, each of them had a, a stocklet. And uh, each of them has been eliminated, uh, fished out uh, by uh, industrial fishing, uh, per seining, in the, in the 50s and 60s. And uh, I have met, in the course of my uh, meandering around uh, the province, I met lots of fishers that participated in this, in this uh, destruction. And what is left in the, in the Salish Sea, or rather in the, in the Georgia Strait, is one stock. And it spawns near Denman Island and uh, 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 Hornby Island. And I was last week, uh, this weekend, um, uh, at a so-called Herring Fest, and it was very interesting because they, they deal with a concept uh, in, that, in uh, the people who are there, and it is uh, uh, both uh, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal that are uh, united in fighting here against the DFO. They fight not only against the non unequitable distribution of, of the fishery, uh, most of it is uh, comes from Vancouver with the purseiners and gillnetters, and they fish in front of their nose the fish that, uh, that they depend on and that they would like to have. That, that is the, the, the obvious thing, that the obvious injustice of it and the obvious inequity of it. But there is also a deeper conceptual problem. There is, it's the, the conception that DFO has that the stocks, uh, that stock, 
is actually uh, what they call is panmictic. It's born anywhere and it goes everywhere. It has no home. It, uh, it operates like capital on Wall Street. It, uh, it goes there and goes here and there. And this conception is, is very Western, if I can say. You try to optimize things. So the, the stock is, is supposed to be optimizing things. Actually, nature, nature doesn't work that way. Uh, uh, herring stocks are like and should be seen like uh, salmon stocks. A salmon goes back to a certain river, right? A certain brook. And each river has its own salmon stock. And how, how do they do that? They don't optimize things. They don't, they're not like on Wall Street saying, this river or this river. Let's go up, down, up again, down again. Uh, like when we go in supermarket and we choose uh, between five sort of soap. We look at all of them and then we choose the one that we want to have. The salmons don't do that. They cannot, they cannot check which river is the best. So what do they do actually? They opt for one sure thing. If they have survived, the place where they come from enable their survival. So what they opt for is going to the same place, doing the same thing as a parent. My friend, uh, <clears throat> I have a friend who has written a, a very good paper about that. Nen Nenzi uh, calls it optimate na optima obstinate nature. Nature has, is obstinate, goes back to the same thing and does the same thing in a circular motion. And herring are also obstinate. Herring, at least the stocklet that existed before, went to the same place. And that's the reason why if you deplete them in a, in a certain place, they don't come back. Even though there is spawning ground and, and everything is fine, they don't come back. They will come back eventually because a few herring uh, make mistakes. Like salmon make mistakes. About three, two, three percent of the salmon don't go to the right rivers. They make mistakes and that becomes the basis for a new run. Herring also do that. Turtles also do that. Turtles are incredible, um, incredible in that they return. I, I, mean, I think they, they commit one mistake in 10,000, something like that. Why? Because beaches don't move. If beaches were moving, they would be making more errors. But one in 10,000 makes, makes uh, an error. Then for that reason, if you extirpate a population of turtles from a beach, it will not be replaced. It will not, the other turtles will not say, oh, that's a nice beach, I go there. So the, the extirpation of the stocks, of stocklets of herring from the, from the uh, Georgia Strait and from the coast has not been replaced by, by uh, space being available for other ones. Now, the last stock that is exists in the Georgia Strait is the one that is being fished right now, and right now with a quota that is much too high around Dan Denman Island and, and, and Hornby Island. And the, the people in, that, uh, in, in this island are choking with rage because they try to reach the DFO, try to reach uh, Ottawa, and the, the, the uh, parliamentary representative was there. I forgot his name, Gord something. Uh, he was also arguing is a totally outrage because, because by fishing this herring, and I will tell you about this fishery, by fishing this herring, this is the last herring that spawns in the Georgia Strait. The others are all gone, and the, the, the management procedure that, have, that has destroyed all the other stocks is now applied to that stock. Now, this is going to be destroyed if, if nothing happens. For what reason? What is actually being done? The traditional way of exporting herring as you have seen, is collecting these uh, this leaves or these fonds covered with eggs and eating that. And it's good food I, uh, that people taste differ. Fish eggs, some people don't like them. But actually, this is traditionally excellent food. Now, 
how do we, with a, with a, with a person, uh, exploit the herring in Canada, in BC? Well, we catch them, we kill them, because the one that have spawned, they leave and they will be coming back next year, right? You collect only the eggs and some of the eggs, and, uh, but you, you, with a, with a persianus or gill netter, you kill them, and then you cut them open, you remove the egg sac, which is 5 to 10% of the weight, and what do you do with the rest? Uh, fertilizer, cat food, or you throw it away. That is the alternative to leaving them alone for the many animals, including Chinook and, uh, uh, and uh, Gorkas, which have been designated as animals that uh, the federal government wants to protect. Uh, the federal government has given 100, 000, 100 million uh, to protect these animals. And the best way to protect them is to leave them some food. So we, we, we fish, we allow fishing for, uh, for we allow fishery where 5% of the, of the biomass is harvested, is used, is exported to Japan because uh, you, you make nice sushi with it and you throw away the rest. This is bizarre for somebody who, like me, has grown up in Europe because herring are actually good food, not only in Aboriginal sense, but also in a Western sense, it's good food. The German love herring, pickled herring uh, uh, on, a, on a bun and stuff is good stuff, but not in Canada. In Canada, it becomes cat food or fertilizer. So th th this fishery is destroyed, is being destroyed right now because of cat food and because of nothing against cat, by the way, nothing. Uh, <laughs> but and, and export to Japan of one-fifth, or sorry, 5% of the body weight. The rest is thrown away, is uh, almost valueless. A, the, this fishery could also be bought with the 100 millions that the Ottawa has given to protect the, the, the Chinook salmon and, and um, orca. So if you want to see crazy, this is this is it. We have crazy in the management of, of the herring. And we have a, a form of crazy that is connected, crazy destructive. And they don't want to learn either because they say the stock goes everywhere, spawn anywhere. It's a version of, of biology that is also wrong. It's bad science. It's not traditional science or or, or, or traditional knowledge against Western science. It's bad science because most, essentially all animals have this return to the place where they were born. And why? Because, as I explained, they cannot optimize things. They cannot choose between different type of soap. They use the, the thing that, that has worked. And what has worked is the same thing as the ancestors did. And that, today I had a visitor that I met uh, in Hornby Island, is an Aboriginal person, and we talked about things, and, and I was explaining that story. He said, it's, that's how we view things uh, in cycle. Well, we don't in the West. We, we, we present progress as an arrow. And this arrow is killing everything. Is killing everything because lots of things are go round and round. Nature is obstinate, and uh, bringing harm, bring breaking this arrow and making it round. This is a big job. That's what we have to do. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, I forgot about one thing. Uh, my wife is here. It's, it's a birthday today. Do you mind clapping a little? <laughs> <laughs> because we also need a cake um, and it's right here so not only do Barb and I use science and culture together we, well I was for soup then so uh, Sandra, we come
down a few a lemon chiffon lemon mousse cake and Barb taught me how to do it. It doesn't look very good. It doesn't look very good, but it's great. <laughs> so on the count of three, happy birthday to Sandra. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Sandra. Happy birthday to you. We want to say how uh, Daniel, Daniel was 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 trying to get out of coming tonight, I think. He told us he couldn't come because it was Sandra's birthday. So we said we'd make her a cake. So <laughs> here it, it looks, is. It looks like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. <laughs> it, it, it's the first time I've ever made a, sh a lemon chiffon cake with lemon mousse. I know it's un not a traditional thing to present cake um, at a talk, but we felt it was really important, and we're kind of renegade that way. So can I use my finger? Okay, we've got to make sure she's got her cake. And now you can have cake, and then we can answer questions. Daniel, you get it up here, too. You get a piece of cake. Oh, he doesn't need any. Does he? Doesn't need it? Okay. Really? But it, we, he did let us, you know. Okay. <laughs> so we're buying you some time to formulate your questions. Oh yeah, you can. Sure. Okay, I think we're ready for the question period. First of all though, I want to thank you for transporting us across time, across space, across disciplines, across epistemologies, for showing us the beauty and the wonder and the mystery of all of it. Um, I'm mesmerized by what you shared with us tonight. Thank you very much, both of you. And Ke'il Juice, I have to apologize. I didn't introduce you when Anne came up because I thought you were speaking sequentially. So please forgive me for that oversight. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> um, so questions. And we're going to ask you to actually um, come up to the mic here on the right-hand side or for some of you on your left side because we're trying to not ha handle things from hand to hand as much. So please, uh, I welcome questions at the microphone right over here. Test, test. Maybe it might do. It's not on. Does it work now? Yes, okay. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks so much for this fantastic presentation. Um, my name is uh, Jens Wieting. I work for Sierra Club and I work primarily on protecting uh, old growth forest and I'm very interested about uh, whether our natural ecosystems are a carbon sink or a carbon source. You, you mentioned carbon a few times and I was wondering whether um, you are gaining more understanding um, about just how much carbon is being sequestered by these ecosystems, particularly the kelp forests and other uh, marine ecosystems, and um, 
whether we have better understanding today how these different ma management practices will make a difference, whether they can absorb more carbon or, or less carbon. Thank you. Okay, so the question was, to kind of what extent do kelp forests sequester carbon and can they be useful, I suppose, in thinking about um, climate mitigation? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, right. So colleagues of ours have actually calculated uh, and estimated how much carbon is sequestered from kelp forests. Um, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but Chris Wilmers out of UC Santa Cruz has done just that. And I think what you bring up is a, is a great point that that's exactly kind of one of the trade-offs associated with having predators back in a system that cause indirectly an expanse of this carbon sucking plant. Um, it's not just kelp actually, it's uh, all sorts of vegetation that happens along our coasts, like uh, eelgrass beds as well. There's a number of people, including my lab, but other people at us, a few that have also documented the degree to which carbon is sequestered in the sediments below eelgrass. Um, meadows, and it can be significant. And certainly there is a, a discussion about trading for blue carbon credits. Um, the degree to which those markets are actually functioning now is, is minimal to my understanding, unless someone else knows more than I, um, but it is certainly part of the discussion when we talk about these kinds of trade-offs in system states. Yep. Does anyone else want to tackle the carbon question? I, I just know that Sigla Um, I have also read that seagrass beds um, um, are the biggest carbon sequester, sequestering system that you can imagine. Mm -hmm. Seagrass bed, not kelp, yeah. but seagrass bed do that. Um, because they, they have a, under uh, rhizome uh, roots, and uh, these roots uh, uh, stay on the ground when, when they die. So there is uh, lots of of carbon that is uh, not uh, free up and uh, that get, get back into the uh, atmosphere when that, the things rots. This really belongs then to the sediment. I don't know the figures from the top of my head, but it is the the highest per area sequest carbon sequestration together with mangrove. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other questions? Uh, I've been working in a fish factory, Canadian fish, for over 30 years, and we've noticed that the uh, herring stock has been going down regularly, consistently, horrendously. We also noticed that uh, uh, l last season we had a whole bunch of herring that were sort of like this big, mm -hmm. which was, uh, I could like, sort of tickle my nose with it. They were not marketable. We actually had to ship a whole, to, I don't know if it actually happened, but they were talking about shipping the stuff to China to process because uh, it, didn't, it didn't fit our machines very well and it was just too tedious. It's sort of like peeling like three inch carrots instead of 12 inch carrots. You know, it's just not what you do in a restaurant. Uh, and because the government insists that under feudalism, they have the right to destroy the, the resource because they have to pay their bar bill, uh, is, is there a, that's how we got Rupert's land, is there a possibility that we could get native and local fishermen to cooperate and say like, let's take back our fish, like just take gigantic nets and preserve them, like create new stocklets? Mm. And mm. the fish carcasses are being sent to be turned into cat food, yes. They're talking about making it to high priced good quality cat food. But there's another market which is fish pellets. And we know this huge expansion of fish farms mean that there's a huge requirement for extra fish pellets. So that's the real reason for the fisheries, I think, is not to create the, uh, the export of undersized, peanut-sized road to Japan. It's because the fish farms need the, need the fishery. So we need real collective action. The only thing the government listens to is massive protest, massive embarrassment. They don't listen to their own scientists. Right. <clears throat> and we have evidence for that when it comes to herring. You're right. I want to link some of the um, ideas that you just brought up to some of 
Um, Daniel's points about stalklets. So you talked about the small carrots, the, the small herring, the ones that are tedious to peel. Um, yeah, you're right. The, there's evidence that the size structure of herring has declined in some regions, and that's probably related to the stalklets because as uh, hereditary chief Bill Gladstone said, when we took out the big ones, it's like taking away the chiefs of the herring, and the small ones don't know where to go. So some of that um, following um, back to natal areas are related to the size structure and knowledge carried by those larger, older fish. And so once you lose that size structure, the larger individuals, you also learn this, lose that same um, transfer of knowledge of um, homing in, in fish too, which is back to the stocklet idea. So I've been 40 years in the, in the business of fisheries uh, all over the world. You have heard uh, there were lots of countries were not mentioned but where I've been, but uh, I've, I've seen fisheries all over the place. Yet I learned something new in uh, when I was in Hornby uh, 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 three days ago, namely that uh, actually the, the salmon farms are actually herring capture system. Mm -hmm. um, the, <clears throat> what happens is they, the small herring get in the cage, uh, the salmon cage, but because they are small and then they like it there because there's always some food. Even if they get, uh, some of them get eaten by the salmon themselves, they actually grow very f fast. And then they cannot leave the cage because they are too big. And uh, the fishery that is done that way by the salmon industry, which likes that because uh, the salmon can eat the herring, is actually not counted. Yet it is uh, every... Every salmon farm is a trap for herring, uh, enormous quantity. And uh, I was reminded that I, I have, over the last 15 years, done, uh, led a global project uh, that estimated the real catch of the world. And we, we have not counted. <laughs> you, you have participated in that. Uh, they, they ha we have not counted for BC the catch of herring in in this trap. And this is should be a reason for the DFO to intervene because this is caught, caught over the quota. And in this context, one can also mention that fishery for the reduction, in other words, fishery for non-food use, are forbidden in Canada. So where, why is this fishery allowed with 5% of the fish uh, being used and the rest uh, essentially thrown away or ground up for feed because there is an exception. The minister has allowed an exception. Mm -hmm. So we, we have a situation in Canada where a lot, we have good laws on the book to protect this species or that species or to regulate the exploitation of this species or that species. And then we have exception that the minister can declare and so we fool ourselves in, 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 in managing our, our stuff properly. And yet uh, we have ministers that, for political reason, because uh, of a political ally, maybe Jim Patterson, uh, uh, maybe, uh, <laughs> allows, uh, can really overthrow the legislation. This is, you have to have wrap, wrap your mind about that. This is, this is stuff. This is other stuff. That whole notion of ministerial discretion, I think, enters largely into the conversation of how do we try and transform governance in, in Canada so that it is just um, and that we avoid capture by industry. Other, other questions or thoughts? I know that there's some other herring the way, experts at, in at the, the audience. This, you have to any other questions? How could we encourage a greater local uh, role on trout fishery by, for, for communities and First Nations? That would be nice. I was saying we could put rebar, uh, choker cables, scrap metal, concrete into the ocean, 
to create new mobile health beds so that they can protect their own fish against the government. Is that like dumping um, iron filings into the ocean? <laughs> no, that was a one shot deal. This is creating a playpen for our heritage. <laughs> okay, another question here? Start writing letters and showing up at places where there are fish farms. Start telling people that write letters to the different um, places. I get a, a paper called the Sentinel out of um, Comox, and it's amazing the stuff that they have in there. So, you know, go online, find them, and start writing letters to the different to the different newspapers. If we keep doing that, maybe somebody will say, oh my, you know, and do something. Or become the next fisheries minister. <laughs> um, we all, as active members of the electorate, can uh, influence people by the way we vote and the knowledge that we make our decisions based on. We can write letters and we can, um, influence decisions as much as we can and right oh there's okay that we should talk about that daniel well some people were talking about civil disobedience in uh, hornby island and i would be remiss not to not mention it mm -hmm. um this uh, at some point uh, when when the things are clear and um, the ministry or the dfo is captured by industry but uh, by a sector of industry or and, and uh, simply doesn't respond to community wishes, then the issue is we live in a democratic country, they don't listen. We make so much noise that they have to listen. And uh, that involves civil disobedience, for example. Okay, any more questions? We, we just oh, want sorry. to talk about one thing. You remember several years ago, 1985, on, um, in Haida Gwaii, the um, young people of my nation decided that there was enough logging on the south end of our island. And they um, did a peaceful demonstration. They followed um, Mahatma Gandhi with no violence, but they went and they stood on the line I'm all for civil disobedience, I have to tell you. Um, I started at a very young age, I was 27, and lived in the area where the tar sands are now. And so I see the destruction that capitalism does, and I feel anxious all the time when I think about, I'm a great grandmother, what I'm leaving for my great granddaughter. And it's pathetic. And that civil disobedience that Barb started telling you about um, led to the formation of Guayanas, uh, one of our largest celebrated co management um, coordinated areas now. Barb sits actually on the archipelago, archipelago management board for that. Um, area that's co-managed by the Council of the Haida Nation and Parks Canada. So there is, um, there is a, a major legacy of that civil dis disobedience. Yeah. It, uh, one other example, you saw um, uh, Chief Bill Gladstone drawing um, herring spawn areas. Um, he deliberately got arrested uh, to force the case that went to the Supreme Court of Canada that got the health sick their right to commercially sell herring. Um, and in fact, a lot of these rights are started by going to jail. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Look how many okay, we have we two got more with that uh, and three remark. more. Okay, we'll start with you, and then we'll go to you, and then you. Okay. Um, I know that Pacific Lions has a big little push campaign. Um, I don't know much about it, but I'm not sure if it's good to recommend it or not. But I, I think they that would be much. Uh, the way they the, um, the, the Pacific Wild was uh, one of the organizations represented in Hornby Island. Yeah. 
and uh, at this hearing first. And one of the organizations that uh, presented a, a case for actually uh, lots of actions, including writing to, to, to Ottawa, bombarding them, and um, if need be, uh, get involved in some civil disobedience. Uh, Pacific Wild was there, big time. so successful, I would say, is in the Discovery Islands with the occupation of the fish farms there, which has led to a, a very good arrangement between the provincial government and the Yankees people. Yeah. And that was only a couple of years old. Uh, you spoke about um, how to read traditional ecological knowledge in Western science, which I think is a really important step moving forward. But in your opinion, I'm just wondering what gap in Western science do you think is best filled by traditional ecological knowledge and then vice versa when gaps in traditional knowledge get filled by Western science? I think the biggest part is recognition of rights and the um, social component because people are part of the ecosystem and that needs to be um, hard and fast because we depend on the whole system for different parts of our food and we have a right to eat. Can I give you an example of that? Um, <laughs> so in that 2014 workshop that kicked off the Sea Otter Kelp Forest work, we asked all of the participants to draw basically a food web of who eats who on the coast and we looked at the scientists' food webs and the food webs by local indigenous leaders and chiefs and knowledge holders. And the scientists didn't include people in their web. And all of the indigenous people did. And then we asked them to draw a time horizon of kind of major changes of sea otters, kelp, and um, people. And most of the, you know, like a, a time series and change in relative abundance. And most of the scientists started in about the 1940s or 50s. And the, the indigenous people started several millennia prior. So it was an exercise to um, open everyone's eyes of the different worldviews, values, and uh, lenses through which we make inferences of data today even. Um, going back through time is so important. Um, and there's good reason for that. Basically, the rediscovery of time and uh, of, um, <coughs> of contingency in fisheries, uh, in fisheries and exploitation of natural resource is something that one can learn from Aboriginal ideas because, because we have fooled ourselves into believing that um, mm, uh, fisheries are like a, like a physical system that can reverse uh, but uh, there is contingency uh, in a species extinct is extinct forever. So, so the, uh, the evolution of a fishery has a trajectory in time that cannot be reversed. That is one element of hardcore science that is contributed from by outside. Another one is the one I have presented. Uh, the, you can say Aboriginal people talk about cycles and connectedness, and uh, this is woolly stuff, and I'm, I'm a hardcore scientist. But I, actually, it is wrong to present uh, fish uh, spawning as an optimization problem that the fish have to resolve. They don't optimize. Uh, the fish, the salmon, don't choose the river where they go uh, as, which is the best river I'm going to go there. They do something else. And this something else is going back to the place where they were born. So the notion that uh, uh, things go in cycle is matches with that. The notion that some scientists have, or the majority, that fish optimize their spawning opportunities is false. Is, is false in terms of science. In terms of science. So the, there, you, you could really benefit from listening to what these folks say. Mm -hmm. hmm? Positive 
story as well. Um, the Squamish uh, uh, Stream Keepers have managed to bring back herring to House Down by wrapping the creosote pilings there and also hanging nets where herring can spawn. And that's been extended to Falls Creek and the Sunshine Coast as well. So more communities are bringing back the stocklets and they're seeing success. There's 1,500 tons of herring off of uh, uh, Pot River this year and a lot more in Gulf Islands as well. Yep. Yeah. They, 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 have, they have done in effect what we do when we put salmon eggs in a river that has no salmon. Because the, the young herring or the young salmon, they go, they, they come out of the egg. That's the place that they are, they're imprinting somewhere in their brain as smell or location or what else. And they return. And now you have a house sound uh, stocklet reestablished. That's the kind of things that would have taken nature to longer to. And uh, this was being discussed uh, in Hornby Island. People talk about. Making, uh, taking some of these horns or alcohol horn covered with eggs and putting them in some other bays. And it could be done, except that you have Jim Patterson's boat waiting to, <laughs> waiting for them. And that is the problem. You have to, to accept to let these stocks rebuild. And, and the DFO is not ready to do that because they have this fiction of, of uh, the fish go anywhere uh, shopping I was going to say the same thing, Daniel, because I know um, my father told me again that um, in the old days they used to, if a river had been ruined somehow, they would take salmon eggs from one stream and put it in another stream and make sure that they, the fish could exist in the, in the stream. And so we also moved herring around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And there's a recorded um, health sick story of also transplanting herring um, in multiple areas. So um, traditional knowledge, oral histories, ethnographic records of just that. Can I say something? I worked for Jimmy Patterson Company, CFC, and, and I can tell you that you Disappointed, but we got all those tiny fish. <laughs> we were really disappointed. So we did some civil disobedience, and we embarrassed them in front of European reporters from for France 24 and others, saying, "Hey, you're not going to take these baby herring. We're going to put them back in the ocean." Mm -hmm. There's got to be some way to say, "Okay, you take the big guys, but we keep the little guys for next year." Mm -hmm. And yeah, they don't need the embarrassment. And we don't want to be popping four-inch fish. Okay, let's have another question. So um, you've talked a lot about how the herring are being managed as if they optimize, they can spawn anywhere. Um, I'm just wondering if you have opinions about kind of what gave birth to that idea, like why that's our current management practice, um, and if there's any studies that are maybe being looked into at a federal level about understanding that they don't optimize in that way, that they are Um, there, there is the concept of zombie IDs. Uh, it, you, it's an idea that you can try to smash and kill, and it, it, it's born again. Uh, and it, ah, uh, and uh, the, the notion that uh, ha that fish, um, except salmon, because that's difficult to argue against that, but that, that fish uh, uh, don't have sight fidelity is, an, is a zombie ID. It, it's always there. When you don't have strong evidence for the technical term is philopatry, uh, you like your, your place and you return to it. Now, the default setting that most fishery scientists have is that you have to prove philopatry. You have to prove that the animal return exactly to the site. And proving that is very difficult. Now we can do it because we can uh, genetically uh, recognize individuals and we can put uh, uh, sensors in the, in the bellies, electronic sensors, and this has been done now for cod. Uh, each, each little bay in Newfoundland has its own stocklet, uh, unless it was extirpated. Sharks go, come, come back to spawn exactly to the same place that is now well documented for in the Caribbean, and the big ones cross the entire Indian Ocean. Uh, they might be in Africa, in East Africa, to 
to frolic around and eat some hippos that fell in the water. <laughs> True story. And they go to Shark Bay, all, all crossing the Antarctic Ocean, it takes them to sea months, to have their young. And, uh, and so philopatry is, is demonstrated for many fish. But for any fish that you have not demonstrated it, it's assumed mm -hmm. to not to be philopatric. Instead of having a default that uh, we assume that all animals are philopatric. And it, if we do that, if we, if we assume that, we would have a more prudent management, right? We would, have, we would not need to have research to prove something. Uh, we, would, we, would, we, would, we would assume that each stock needs to be protected at its own level. But if you don't assume that, you can fish the hell out of something because they're supposed to mix. So that, that is also the reason why philopatry in salmon is not really liked. Because the First Nation before, they, mo they caught most of the salmon in rivers when they have already make, made a choice to go to this river or that river. If you catch them at sea, you catch a mixture of, of them. And you're going to overfish some of them and maybe underfish some of them. It's suboptimal, actually, to catch the fish in the, in, in, the, in the open ocean. It's much better to catch them in rivers when they have already chosen, because then you can regulate how much you catch of that river, river that, how much of that arm of the river and that arm of the river. But, but uh, you find all kinds of justification. And the reason why you, 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 you want to catch them in the ocean is because you catch them in a larger amount with uh, gin netters or, or, or immense purse seiners. Whereas if you catch them up rivers, you, you catch them through small scale operation. And the conflict, and it's not a conflict only in fisheries, the conflict of agriculture, uh, industrial production, everything is concentration and, and the concentration of wealth and power against uh, diffusion against against things being diffused. Mm -hmm. the, it was like that uh, with whaling. When, when whaling was, uh, was permitted and in BC, there was one factory with probably one owner. Now, there, is the whale, there are the whales, and the whale watching operation all along the coast is much better. So it, it's a philosophy, almost, behind that. And, and uh, the, the market-oriented stuff that we have is likes to things to be concentrated in a few players, a few hands, because the DFO says if the fishery is concentrated, it's easier to manage. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's not a reason, because the owners, the, your employer there, plays golf with the minister. Yeah, I'll just kind of emphasize some of those points. I think a broad challenge in fisheries management is that it tends to be done at coarse spatial and temporal scales, in part because it's easier to implement, um, but if you realize that there is much finer spatial scale processes happening ecologically and socially, then you, you have real problems. So um, understanding those spatial dynamics is pretty key. Otherwise, we, you get what we've been calling cryptic collapses. Um, if you look at the regional scale and yet you don't recognize the stocklets, you don't see the collapse, right, if you aggregate all those data. Um, and then specifically what, when it comes to herring, you ask for evidence and what the latest data are. Um, there is genetic data out of the University of Washington in a recent paper um, that is showing really high uh, specificity and spatial structure in Pacific herring and um, herring in Washington State and Alaska. And it'll be um, a big deal when that paper comes out. Maybe two more questions? So um, Washington State actually does uh, manage their, their herring populations on those kind of smaller stock aggregate levels, uh, but the, they're still not doing great. So I, like, DFO is managing on these larger portion scales that don't necessarily represent what's happening on in the stocklets, but Washington is, and it's not it's not necessarily any better. So just want to. Well, the quote that was must be adjusted low. If, they, if, if you have stocklets and you have still a, a high quota for each of them, they will go down. And Cherry Point is in Puget Sound that's highly polluted and really industrialized, right? 
so the habitat is, is not there as it would be in places that aren't so affected by coastal change. Yeah. Okay, one last question this evening. Yes. Hi, I'm, I'm wondering if there's any... Oh, okay, uh, we'll have two questions. Sorry. Okay. You get your chance to Go ahead, sir. Oh, okay. I'm wondering if there's any disagreement amongst the First Nations about how to manage the West Coast fisheries, the heron, the salmon, and the otters. Is it all unanimous, or is it uh, First Nations, some are commercially interested and some are culturally interested? We've seen with the, uh, the pipeline and the uh, problems there between the hereditary chiefs and the elected chiefs that there's an inconsistency. Is that the same uh, to do with the fisheries? I'm going to talk about the uh, pipeline first. The elected chiefs are the result of Indian affairs in Ottawa. Their money comes from there. And the hereditary chiefs, they are people who have been born into their positions primarily, and their attachment to the land is paramount. So the people who are going against what the hereditary chiefs want are people who have been elected and they're there for three years and then they move, they could move on if there isn't a financial gain for them in that position. Having said that, when we look at all the different forms of fisheries that are in the waters in several of the nation's places, we're all human. We've all been colonized. And so it takes decolonizing ourselves and going back to our ancestors' values about um, looking after not just the land, but looking after the fish and everything that supports us. So I think that I think that we all have lessons to learn from looking at what happens when we're colonized and how our ancestors possibly came from other areas, some of mine did, and why they came here looking for a better life, like trying to get away from something that was um, suppressing them. And so we bring what we learn from other places and so what First Nations are, are humans. They, they change their minds. They learn things. They figure out that making money isn't all it's drummed up to be, although it would be nice, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. Does that answer your question, or have I avoided it? The fishery is failing because we have a government that doesn't take into account what happens locally. They look at what the big man on top wants because he can go to Ottawa and lobby. I've been to Ottawa to lobby, and I know what it takes to get the door open. You either have to have power or you have to have money, and usually the two are hand in hand. And First Nations normally, because of the places they've been put on the land, away from centers that would make them money, are not the rich people. So yeah, there's some people who want to make money commercially. Can you blame them? We've been living in, in a place where we're not allowed to get mortgages, where we can't up until 1951, we couldn't hire lawyers. Up to 1951, my great-grandmother and everybody else in my family couldn't come home because of the laws that were put in place. 
by the British North American Act back in the 1700s. And it gives you a lot of pause to think about what happens and why people want to have a better life. Thanks, Barb. I'll, I'll also share what we learned to, given the surveys we, we did and the data we collected. Um, depending on the question and depending on the context, we saw both diversity of ideas and opinions and uh, consensus. Um, so for example, in the, the sea otter story, uh, depending on whether uh, participants in our survey were in British Columbia, Canada versus Alaska really affected their impressions on the, um, their, their, uh, their ability to adapt to sea otter recovery given federal regulations. And that's because in Alaska, um, in, Indigenous people in Alaska are exempt from the Marine Mammal Act. Um, whereas here, they are not. And so what I just bring this up that in the data, we see differences and we see similar similarities depending on the context, but depending on the legal context, social context, ec economic context. Um, the other big um, hypothesis we had with our data in Alaska is we felt that the communities that had existed with sea otter recovery for a long time might have been um, uh, more uh, adept at adapting to the the um, this perturbation. And in fact, it was the federal laws really that drove the results of our surveys. So I just bring that up that the, there's various social and ecological contexts um, within nations and between them, among them, that would influence the, the results of your question. Okay, we have one more question, sir. Uh, sort of related, um, I think uh, you mentioned that some nations up the coast were not very happy about the idea of otters coming back. And I wonder why that was. Because they eat their food. They eat um, uh, crabs, Dungeness and, and red rock crabs. They eat clams, cockles, abalone, um, California mussels, tunicates, chitons. Sea cucumbers. So, um, I, in fact, I can tell you that a recent paper um, identified that they eat 100 different, at least, invertebrates. But the primary reason of the, the, that conflict is because so many of those invertebrates are incredibly important food sources, foods to feed your family, to feed your kids. Um, they are beyond food also. Uh, they're culturally really significant. Um, Barb will tell you about abalone and um, a special unique aspect of abalone in Haida culture. And of course, they're important livelihoods. And so when something threatens your food source and, and um, your cultural identity and your livelihoods, that's when conflict really arises. Do you want to share the abalone? Do I have somebody else? A bit like wolves on land? Yeah. Uh, you, you, nobody would ask ever, while, while these farmers uh, or this sheep, sheep, what, what is it? Somebody who has sheep, a sh uh, anyway. Where are they, why are they uh, getting rid of the wolves? Well, because they eat sheep, that, that's about it. And so if you have to see a relationship of, of exploiting the, the sea to, for food, that's the wolves that eat your sheep. They're cute, but... <laughs> sea otters are cute, too. Um, That's what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things we found was um, when, when we think of abalone, and um, we have several different names in dialects for the name, because obviously before we were colonized and brought into two villages, we lived all over the islands along the coastline. And one of the things that happened after uh, abalone was, was fished out by commercial fisher, fishermen was we weren't allowed to gather abalone any longer. And one of the things we found when our grandparents my father, um, that age, and me. Um, the thing that they wished for most before they passed was to have even a raw abalone, you know, because it was, it was a delightful memory, and it's a delightful memory for me to take it out of the water, to, 
to take it out of the shell, to wash it and eat it raw, fresh out of the ocean. And we don't have that damn privilege anymore because of overfishing. So it's the same in most countries where things are good to eat out of the ocean. Thank you so much, Keel Juice, and Daniel, Anne. That was excellent. And Sandra. And Sandra. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I just want to thank the Ting Foundation for funding this Dean Speaker Series, as well as the Alumni Association. And I want to thank all of you for being a great audience and wish you good health on your journey forward. Good night.